Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. After the faunal turnovers of the late Permian, due to the most severe mass extinction in Earth's history, the niche of large terrestrial predator suddenly became available. The saber-toothed gorgonopsids died out at the transition from the Permian to the Triassic, and, roughly 10 million years later, another lineage of apex predators arose to fill their niche, the erythrosuchids. These relatively basal archosauriforms evolved from proterosuchid-like ancestors during the early Triassic. Unlike the latter, erythrosuchids were fully terrestrial predatory reptiles with bulky bodies, semi-erect limbs, and massive, deep skulls. Indeed, their heads appear almost disproportionately large in comparison to the rest of their bodies, making the animals resemble bobbleheads. In terms of size, they ranged between 2 and 5 metres. Like their ancestors, these reptiles also possessed a notch near the tip of their upper jaw, although these were far smaller and less conspicuous than in the proterosuchids. The teeth were generally conical and serrated, mounted within powerful jaws that were reminiscent of those of the later theropod dinosaurs. Erythrosuchids were widespread and successful hunters, with fossil remains recovered from South Africa, China and Russia, spanning a period of roughly 12 million years before dying out during the Middle Triassic. Their main prey base would have included the large herbivorous Dicynodonts, along with any smaller archosauromorphs that got in their way. Several features set them apart from other archosauriforms, and are also seen in later, more derived archosaurs. For example, they lack teeth on the palate, which are found in earlier archosauriforms. In Erythrosuchids, the centra, which are the central parts of the vertebrae, are deeply indented on either side, differing considerably from the usual cylindrical shape of these in earlier archosauriforms, but similar to that in later archosaurs. They are notable for being among the first archosauriforms to have a triradiate pelvic girdle, with three projecting areas formed from three bones, an ilium and an elongated pubis and ischium. Although it is small, the fourth trochanter, a ridge on the femur that serves as a muscle attachment in archosaurs, first appears in erythrosuchids. The triradiate pelvis and fourth trochanter are both features which indicate that erythrosuchids had a semi-erect stance, similar to that of later archosaurs. More basal archosauriforms, such as proterosuchids, lack these features and probably had a more sprawling posture. Six or possibly seven genera have been described and named, with Vishkovisaurus possibly being dubious. The smallest of these animals was Garjania, which reached a maximum length of 2 metres and weighed roughly 70 kilograms. Like all erythrosuchids, it was a predator with a proportionally large skull and curved blade-like teeth. Two species are known, Garjania prima from the early Triassic of Russia and Garjania mabida of South Africa. Gower and colleagues examined thin sections of seven Garjania madiba limb bones from individuals of different sizes. Inside, they found signs of rapid growth, relatively messy organisation riddled with vascular canals and newly made bone structures called primary osteons. Even in Garjania that had periodic stopping points in their growth, likely in response to dry seasons or other times of stress. The bone in between those lines show quick growth spurts. These starts and stops might explain why archosauriforms, and not the surviving proto-mammals, came to rule the Triassic. Garjania and its relatives may have outpaced our own ancestors and cousins in terms of their life cycle, growing faster and reaching sexual maturity earlier. Simply put, the archosaurs may have outreproduced the proto-mammals, letting them evolve more quickly and limiting niches the proto-mammals could then create. Similar in size was the Chinese Shansi Sucus, with a typically boxy skull and stocky postcranial skeleton. It was one of two erythrosuchids native to China, the other being the early Triassic Gu Chengasuchus. This animal was also among the earliest of all archosauriforms appearing only a few million years after the end Permian mass extinction. It is known from rather jumbled remains, and is rather poorly understood and understudied to this day. Aside from Garjania, 
At least two genera have been recovered from Russia, including Uralosaurus and Chalishavia. As before, these animals are known from partial, scrappy fossils consisting of small bone fragments from multiple individuals. As such, we can only gain a somewhat general impression of these predators, being robust hunters measuring in the 2 to 4 metre range. However, the most famous and best known Erythrosuchid, Erythrosuchus itself, is thankfully known from more complete remains. Known from the early to middle Triassic of South Africa, this was the largest known member of its family, and would have been the apex predator of the ancient Karoo ecosystem. Measuring up to 5 metres long, it walked on all fours and had limbs which were positioned semi-vertically under its body, unlike the more sprawling gait of earlier reptiles. Its head was large and dinosaur-like, reaching a length of 1 metre, and had sharp conical teeth. Apart from its size, Erythrosuchus would have looked rather similar to its relatives. It is known from dozens of specimens, suggesting that the animal was at least somewhat common in its environment for a large predator. Early restorations of the skull of the animal depicted it as being tall, similar in appearance to Tyrannosaurus. However, a complete skull that was later described in 1963 revealed the true shape was less tall than previously thought. The brain case has also been studied, and possesses features that are shared with other early archosauriforms. Many of these characteristics are considered plesiomorphic or ancestral in archosaurs. While Erythrosuchus is not considered an archosaur itself, it is thought to be closely related to the last common ancestor of all archosaurs. The hypothetical last common ancestor of archosaurs is thought to have shared many features with Erythrosuchus, many of which are found in the brain case. Some features of the ankle of Erythrosuchus suggest that it was beginning to adapt towards Digigrady, or walking on its toes rather than having the entire foot placed on the ground. The ankle is also similar to that of later archosauriforms such as crocodilians and dinosaurs, suggesting that the animal was an active hunter with at least some form of elevated metabolism. More derived archosauriforms would continually build on these traits, showing a trend towards decreasing size in terrestrial forms. While the Erythrosuchids were large apex predators, more derived forms, aside from the semi-aquatic and crocodile-like phytosaurs, were rarely over 2 metres long and were oftentimes significantly smaller still. Beyond Erythrosuchidae, we come to the genus Asperoris from the Middle Triassic Mandibeds of southwestern Tanzania. Known only from a single, well-preserved, albeit incomplete skull, with extrapolation suggesting an overall length of about 2 metres for the entire animal. Aside from this, we cannot be completely certain of the life appearance of Asperoris, but it seems to have been a more slender-bodied hunter than the Erythrosuchids, with a skull less outrageous in size. Following on from this mysterious creature were two rather similar genera, Dorosuchus and the famous Euparcaria. The former was native to Russia during the Middle Triassic. Most specimens are known from a single block of siltstone from a locality known as Burdankia 1. Limb and hip elements, sacral and caudal vertebrae, and a brain case are preserved in the block and represent four individuals. A partial ilium is also known from another locality. Dorosuchus was a small animal, only about a metre long in life, with powerful jaws and sharp curved teeth. It was formally classified as a member of the family Euparcariidae, although this is now thought to be a poorly supported clade. However, it is clear that Dorosuchus was a somewhat close relative of Euparcaria, a far better known archosauriform from the Middle Triassic of South Africa. It was a small reptile that lived between 245 and 230 million years ago, and was close to the ancestry of Archosauria, the group that includes dinosaurs, pterosaurs, modern birds and crocodilians. Euparcaria had hind limbs that were slightly longer than its forelimbs, which has been taken as evidence that it may have been able to rear up on its hind legs as a fluctuative biped. Although Euparcaria is close to the ancestry of fully bipedal archosaurs such as early dinosaurs, it probably developed bipedalism independently. 
Euparkaria was not as well adapted to this form of locomotion as in dinosaurs, and its normal movement was probably more analogous to a crocodilian high walk. In all, this genus was rather tiny for an archosauriform. Measuring just 60 centimeters long as an adult, it would have hunted insects, amphibians, and other small reptiles, grabbing them with its strong, stout jaws. Other possible adaptations to bipedalism include rows of osteoderms that could have stabilized the back and long tail and acted as a counterbalance to the rest of the body. Paleontologist Rosalie Ewer suggested in 1965 that Euparkaria may have spent most of its time on four legs, but moved on its hind legs only while running. The forelimbs are still relatively long and the head is rather large so that the tail may not have effectively counterbalanced its weight. The position of muscle anchorage points on the humerus or thigh bones suggests that Euparkaria could not have held its legs in a fully erect posture beneath its body, but would have held them slightly out to the side as in modern crocodilians and most other quadrupedal archosauriforms. Euparkaria had a large backward pointing projection on the calcaneum, the ankle bone, that would have given it strong leverage to the ankle during locomotion. Some specimens of this animal preserve bony rings in the eye sockets called sclerotic rings, which in life would have supported the eye. The sclerotic ring is most similar to those of modern birds and reptiles that are nocturnal, suggesting that they may have had a lifestyle adapted to low light conditions. During the early Triassic, the Karoo Basin was about 65 degrees at south latitude, meaning that Euparkaria would have experienced long periods of darkness in winter months. In terms of classification, the genus was closely related to the common ancestors of the phytosaurs and the true archosaurs. Although some phylogenetic studies place the superficially crocodile-like Proterochampsians in a more derived position than Euparkaria, you can rest assured that I'll be covering these in a future video. It is interesting that these archosauriforms were all active carnivorous predators, with lifestyles that presaged the spectacular success of later archosaurs. Indeed, the ancestral members of the crocodile and bird line archosaurs essentially replaced and outcompeted the erythrosuchids and smaller euparkaria like forms roughly 230 million years ago. While their time in the spotlight was relatively brief, these brick-headed carnivores are still poorly known and their names sadly carry no currency with the general public. I hope this video can help to change that situation, at least a little bit. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be covering more speculative evolution content, so I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.